All right, so we're going to learn about proofs, geometric proofs. So we had talked about logic proofs previous, previously, and we had also talked about um, you know different geometric relationships. Now we're going to put it together and see if we can demonstrate using uh, logical reasoning whether or not some fact or relationship is always true. All right, uh, basically proving a relationship is always true. All right, so all of this stuff that you have here, I mean, it's it's a lot, but you kind of look at it and say, well, yeah, but some of them are filler episodes because you look at it and say, well, that that's common sense. That's common sense. That's common sense. We didn't need a rule for that. But then there's some of them where it's like, whoa, okay, that, that that's a good one. I didn't know that one. All right. So I'll give you an example. Leg of a right triangle. One of two sides of the right triangle forms a right angle. Probably did not need a rule for that. All right. Because, and I, I use my son as a benchmark. Like when he first starts learning stuff, that's my indicator of when people learn that stuff these days. So he's in fourth grade, he's learning about perpendicular, right triangles, you know, different geometric shapes. He's not going into any kind of crazy detail with it, but he's at least heard the term before. All right, so you have a right triangle. There's your right triangle. One side is the hypotenuse. That's the longest side. The other two are your legs. I'll just singularize it. Put it in a singular form. All right, so did you need a rule for that? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but leg of a trapezoid, well, maybe, especially if you don't know what a trapezoid is. Okay. Leg of an isosceles triangle. Median of a triangle. Now that one's that one's kind of weird because median, the idea of a median, medium, middle ground, you know, that kind of it kind of kind of feels like it's talking about the middle, so that part is all right. Segment whose mid whose endpoints are a vertex of a triangle and the, and the midpoint of the opposite side. That's an oddly detailed explanation for something that sounds like it's really just talking about the middle of something. All right. So, what does that mean? You know, because complementary angles we've dealt with before, uh, base of an isosceles triangle. You know. The, you can kind of figure all that stuff out if only you knew what the characteristics were of a triangle. So if I were to say you have a triangle here, for example, just an arbitrarily drawn triangle. This would be the vertex angle. All right. Actually, every angle is a vertex angle, but what we tend to think about when we're talking about a triangle is a triangle is a base. You know, like if you're talking about the area of a triangle, it's half the base times the height. The angle that's opposite of that base would be your vertex angle. Right. So it's really just thinking about the angle that opens up onto that base. Right. So with that information in mind, you could figure out things like base angles. So where would the base angles be? Well, my guess it would be the angles that are on the base. Okay? The vertex angle, pretty easy to identify because you have a vertex that you're calling that top point. The angle associated with that would be your vertex angle. And so now that you have that stuff in mind, you can start to talking about things like going back to the median of a triangle, so I'll just highlight it. Segment whose endpoints are a vertex of the triangle and the midpoint of the opposite side. Now that we have this triangle labeled up, that definition makes a whole lot more sense. All right. A segment, so a line segment, whose endpoints are the vertex angle, so here's the vertex angle, that looks weird and the midpoint of the opposite side. So I'm just gonna ballpark it. It's gonna be right about here. Connect those two and what you have is the median. All 
All right, so that line segment is the median. And it's specifically because it's the midpoint, it intersects the midpoint of the base, all right? The midpoint cuts the line segment into two congruent segments so that those, those two segments on the bottom of the base, on either side of that, that point on the base would have to be congruent to one another. So geometrically equivalent to one another, all right? So I'm referring to these particular segments here, these guys. All right, poor quality highlighting. Let me just do that again. Go with something a little bit more vibrant. So this one, that's not a highlighter. Steer right to you. So that one and that one. All right. So a lot of this table in the vocabulary, it's going to come down to really just kind of trying to visualize what's going on. Because like a diameter. If I tell you that you have a circle and I ask you to draw the diameter, bless you, solid chance you're going to get that, right? Like, I'm confident that everybody will get that, you know? So if the dean came into the classroom and said, your job's on the line, dude, the only, you're fired if every single one of your students can't draw a diameter. I'll be like, all right, bring it on, right? That's how confident I am about that one. But the definition, a segment that has endpoints on a circle and that passes through the center of the circle, also the length of that segment, such detail in that explanation, you know, like a little less confident that everybody's going to come up with that. Intuitively, you understand it. You drew it. That means you definitely understood it. But would you have written even words to that effect? Maybe, maybe not. All right. So that's why you have this entire table. It's not for you to just say, oh, I got a handout, it's got words on it and stuff, let me just, uh, let me just put that away. You know, like, this, this is, I, uh, how do I describe it? Uh, very important, uh, but to the point where it, it could be, you know, the saving grace or the cause of uh, mass hysteria. Uh, it's, it's really just, it's a, it's a glossary but it's also the kind of thing where if, if the next time you look at it is when you're taking an assessment, you're, um, how you say, uh, screwed. Yeah, because it, it, it's like the familiarity with it is what's gonna make it useful, all right? So just, just keep that in mind. We will, in class, be constantly referring back to this, but I recommend, and, and wait, Alyssa, I don't expect you to take a handout around with you every single day. But just in the attempt to familiarize yourself with it, why not take a picture of it? And every now and then, if you got some downtime, depending on where your downtime is, you know, uh, the bathroom seems to be the downtime for a lot of my high school students. You know, I, I only know this because they always take their phones with them. And then they're gone for like 15 minutes. So I can only imagine that they're studying like geometry rules in, uh, you know, while, while they're in there. So. Like, if that's you, then by all means. But if not, you know, like, take the bus when you're on the bus. You know, just find a moment and just, you know, just read through it and see if you can kind of visualize these things. It'll make a difference. All right. So I um, hijacked pretty much all of this stuff from a website. Um, I have a kind of a rule of thumb when it comes to making my own notes. That is, uh, I tend to not want to make my own notes because... Yeah, like this stuff's been around for hundreds of years, in some case thousands. I, I, somebody's already typed the words that I'm thinking. So I found it online, but I, I sourced it. Uh, I, I felt a little embarrassed uh, sourcing a site called mathgiraffe.com, but you know, like it is what it is. Um, I paraphrased a lot of it, but this is the, the best argument I could find for, and, and aligned with my thinking, of why proof in geometry is useful. So I'll just read it to you. I know it's like there's words there, you can read it yourself, but I wanna emphasize certain points. A proof in an argument that begins with a known fact or a given premise when we worked with logic proofs, logical deductions are made through a series of conclusions based on facts, theorems and axioms proving a proposition, for example, the sum of angles 
uh, angle measures in a triangle equals 180. By writing out a proof, the answer is undeniable. The key word there is undeniable. All right. So when you make an argument, when you have a conversation with somebody and you're debating, uh, you know, I, I had to explain to my son what Super Tuesday was uh, today, uh, specifically because all of our shows were not on because of Super Tuesday, and he's like, what the hell is Super Tuesday? Again, he's, he's in fourth grade. So politics is not uh, gonna hold much interest to him, except when it gets in the way of his shows. Now me personally, back in the day, it wasn't politics, it was the New York Yankees. Anytime I wanted to watch a show, Every time I wanted to watch my show, it seemed like there was a Yankee game on. Even though my show is on, like, repeat, it was like, all right, going to sit down and watch my show. Turned it on, and there's a Yankee broadcast. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Another one? So I understood his frustration, but I did have to explain to him what Super Tuesday was. And in the process, I talked to him about how people don't agree when, deal, when having a political debate because facts are not really the, the, the conversation. You know, like people take what they have as an opinion and portray those opinions as fact, and that's where arguments come into play, right? And so every, and, and there are debates. You know, a person makes a statement. This is why we should do this. This is why that, that's a bad idea or a good idea. And then somebody rebuts their statement because their statement, while there may be some facts embedded in there, is largely opinion, right? And it goes back and forth, right? Proofs are not opinion-based, right? That's the undeniable term there. So if I were to outline a proof to somebody so a detailed analytic proof, or not even an analytic proof, just, just like even a, a logic proof. So something that is grounded in logical reasoning, and from that we draw a conclusion, there is no yeah, but. But what about this? What about that? What about that? Yeah, but nothing. It's undeniable. I have proved it. So th there is no conversation anymore. It's a shut your mouth kind of situation. It's like, boom, 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 boom. Now go. I have proved what was meant to be proved, all right? There is no rebuttal necessary because I have justified using logical reasoning. That can't happen in everyday conversation. I mean, people try to do it and they use fancy terms and um, in doing so, they lead people to believe that what they're doing is presenting an argument that's grounded in logical reasoning. But really, if there's an underlying agenda, then it can't possibly be that way. So think of it this way. If I walk into a situation, you present me with some facts, key facts and figures, even if it's a political situation, or uh, if you want to stay away from politics, you talk about like, favorite athlete, favorite movie, why this, uh, Jeter's better than A-Rod or vice versa. You know, like whatever you want it to be. You know, if you gave me all the information and I was completely unbiased, right? So maybe not Jeter and A-Rod because I'm a Mets fan, you know, but like, obviously I wouldn't want to be talking about whether Jurassic Park is a great movie because, you know, obviously biased, but unbiased opinion, I look at all the facts and I draw a conclusion based off of where the facts take me, that would be a logical argument and that would be a proof, right? But if I come in with a preconceived notion of Jurassic Park is a top five movie of all time, and then I tailor my argument to prove that point, that's not a logical argument, all right? So it, it's not grounded in strictly logical reasoning, all right? Proofs are. Geometry proofs specifically, but logical reasoning proofs definitely. Um, so anyway, why are they so important? Well, everything I just said is why they're important, but it was, uh, it was a very nice way of articulating it here in this article that I found. Logical reasoning and deduction are central to understanding not only geometry, but mathematics as a whole. 
being able to tell the difference between obvious mathematical concepts and the one that, ones that need to be justified leads to a new level under, of understanding in math. It shows comprehension of deductive logic and the ability to structure arguments to make mathematical conclusions. Right? So that's a key ingredient there. The ability to structure arguments to make mathematical conclusions. All these skills are tantamount uh, to reaching a more mature and complete knowledge of uh, geometry and arithmetic. All right? But swap out geometry, arithmetic for um, U.S. history, or you know, like if you want politics, if, you, if that's what you like, um, literature, um, ast uh, astronomy, you know, whatever, whatever your subject of interest is, this is a key ingredient. When mathematicians first began to form rules to prove valid mathematical statements, they did so through trial and error. This allowed congruence in learning. One person could show another person a mathematical rule and prove it through reproduction, which in turn made it valid. Right? So I can tell you that a, a, a right angle is 90 degrees. All right? so, and I can justify it by drawing 100 right angles and measuring each one of them and saying, see, this one's 90 degrees also. And so is that one. And so is that one. I have a sneaky feeling that they're all 90 degrees. But we've only measured three of them, so let's measure the other 97 just to be sure. And it turns out that all of them were 90 degrees, except for the one that I accidentally drew incorrectly, which kind of proved by contradiction that all right angles are 90 degrees. All right. But obviously, that's, that's not something you want to do in all situations. You don't want to prove something is going to be valid by trial and error alone. So, I mean, flight. I mean, I've, we've all seen the videos, the uh, Orville and Wilbur, right? The right, the right brothers. I'm I, I blanking on their names. Are, are those their names? Yeah. Okay. Because I like I couldn't get past Redenbacher for some reason. You know, like it's, yeah, it's like. <laughs> so I, I I I jammed myself up there. But we've all seen the videos of like the early attempts at flight with like the planes uh, that had like like three or four different wings and the 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 early attempt at the helicopter, the one that like compresses in and on on itself, and then eventually they show uh, the Wright brothers in uh, Kitty Hawk, I think. Uh, successfully taking off. So that, that was a, an attempt to successfully fly. But honestly, I would like to, if before getting on a plane, that very first plane, the first commercial airline, I would like to see some data, some information convincing me that this is a safe way to travel that does not involve them saying, all right, well, Last time we, we took this plane up, it didn't crash. So we're good. Get on board. Put your, put your bags in the, in the cargo hold. All right? Even if they said the last five times we took this plane up, it didn't crash. The last hundred times, it didn't crash. You're getting better. The last thousand times, it didn't crash. All right, cool. I want to know that it's never going to crash. All right? Now... There are the exceptions to things, but I want to know that mechanically it's a sound uh, engineering principle, right? So what do they do? They, they make simulations. You know, they, they test out theories using models, scale models. They don't, they don't just send up planes hundreds of thousands of times and hope that they make it. Um, same thing with uh, laboratory experiments. You know, like, you don't just immediately jump into human trials, right? Because if you do that, then you could have a problem on your hands. And uh, the ethics aside, you know, they, they start off with simulations and they get into the, the laboratory rats and then they go from there. But the empirical approach involves them developing a proof within a certain set of parameters. I mean, it's more in the realm of statistics, but it's still the same idea. Getting at a methodology for determining that something is always true or I'll even go with damn near always true. 
because in most cases, you know, the real world will settle, will settle for damn near always. We will ideally have always, but damn near is, is, is pretty good too. All right. Uh, as powerful as our brains are, they can miss key facts and be fooled. There are times when things seem perfectly reasonable and they turn out to be wrong. That's why we need to prove things. When you go through step by step with the deductions laid out, then you know you've done everything absolutely correctly. Um, yeah, and a, a simplistic example from math class, you know, so just any, any math class. You try a technique to solve a problem that you think is going to work all the time. Teacher has a method that's really, I mean, really complicated. It takes up like half the board. And you're like, yeah, but my way took two steps and I got it right. Is your way always going to work? That's what you want to know because you, you don't want to rely on that technique on a big test if it turns out it's only going to work that one time you tried it in class. All right? If it works every time, then you stumbled on, maybe not even stumbled on, maybe you were insightful enough to come up with a technique that's going to work all the time that just saves everybody a ton of time. All right? And you know, as a teacher, I've been in a situation where I've had, and uh, there were great moments, uh, really long, articulately presented solutions to problems. And then a student at the end of it who clearly was brighter than me, or more insightful, I'll, I'll give them that, brighter, I don't know. But, but they would raise their hand and say, couldn't you have just done this? And I'm like, no, you have to do it this way. And then I go home and I think about it. I'm like, yeah, they were right. So I don't let them know that. I just tell the next, like the next semester, the next group. I'm like, I came up with this really brilliant approach to solve this problem. And, and, and you know, some might think you have to solve it like using this method, but you could really just do this. I'm so smart, you know. But, you know, that, that's, that's part of it, like vetting it out and making sure it always works. Um, most of the time, I, like all kidding aside, what I'll do is I'll tell the student, like, honestly, I don't know. Maybe it'll work every time. Maybe you just got lucky. Do you want to take the chance? I say, do it my way. Let me think about your approach. And if it turns out you're right all the time, I'll come in tomorrow and we'll talk about it. And I'll tell everybody, forget everything I told you yesterday. We're going to do it this new way. All right? But, you know, that, that's something that you go through the proof process. So applications are everywhere. They're in science, they're in uh, health, uh, just, you know, physiology, things like that. I mean, uh, in, my, in my stack classes, I have a lot of students that want to, uh, they want to go into nursing, um, physical therapy and things like that. Uh, the, there was a, a lot more students who wanted to be physical therapists, I'd say about 15 years ago. And then the, the market got so saturated that there's less folks that want to go into physical therapy and more people who want to go into nursing. There's always a demand for nurses, but physical therapy, you know, it's a very specialized uh, area where you could end up, um, you know, going through all the schooling and not having a job waiting for you. So that's kind of tricky. But, you know, like the applications in those areas, you know, I, I went to physical therapy on Monday and they showed me a bunch of exercises because I have thoracic and cervical spine issues. And so they're like, do this, do that, do that. Now, I don't need them to show me like, how they know. Like, I, I, don't, I don't need to see their degree. I don't need to see, a, 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 honestly, if they just sound like they know what they're talking about, I'm usually good. But there, there better be some underlying reason for why they're suggesting these particular exercises for me. You know, and those exercise, those those reasons better not be along the lines of, well, you got back problems, and uh, when I looked this up in the book in the back room, it said in under back. Uh, this this was the, the the first exercise I saw, so give it a shot. If it helps, do it. If not, um, you you might have you might have to go to the hospital because you you'll make it all worse. You know, like that's not what you want to hear. You want to hear that it's a tried and true approach for being able to resolve whatever issue a person might have, right? So 
Yeah, I, I mean, in terms of the rationale behind it, that, that's really what it is. Now, does that mean that you should have to learn about geometry proofs? I, probably not. I don't, I don't, I don't know why. Um, I don't know why geometry proofs are really their own designated topic in any course. It really should just be here. There's a rule. Let's let's prove that it's a, a rule that's going to work in all cases, and then go from there. So basically, every rule that we're going to prove is something that I think you should have proved when you were in fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade. You know, like and, and what I mean by not not one, fifth, sixth, or seventh. I mean fifth, sixth, and seventh. Like the first time you learned what a midpoint was, you should have learned or, or you should have proved why that relationship is true. So that there, should, there shouldn't be like a whole topic where it's like, all right, let's prove it, everything about geometry right now. It just seems like it's out of, out of whack, but this is, uh, this is where we're at, all right? But something about the rationale, just because I know people will have the feeling of like, why, why, why are we doing this? Right? So, um, so write a conclusion based on the given in each question. Right? Like we use the given as um, a noun. So it's kind of, well, it is a noun, but it's like, it's awkwardly phrased the way the sentence is presented. If you read it the wrong way, it makes, it makes it sound like it's nonsense, but it's write a conclusion based on the given in each question and then state the reason for your conclusion. Okay, right? so M is the midpoint of ST. All right, so that's a given fact. So basically, your first step in coming up with any conclusion is to see if you can reason it out using your own prior knowledge. So think to yourself, all right, common sense, what do you got for me? All right. If M is the midpoint, and just kind of talk to yourself a little bit. And, you know, it goes back to the idea of like, why are we always in groups for these activities? Well, because it's weird for people to talk to themselves during tests. So I like it better when people talk to each other during tests. It's easier to bounce ideas off that way. M is the midpoint of ST. So what you say is, OK, so what does that mean? Well, I think it means that these two line segments would have to be the same. All right, so going from S to M and then M to T. Now, you can, you can name your line segments any way you want. Certain textbooks and online resources, state exams, whatever, they'd have you think that you have to name it in a very particular way. There's no justification for that. All right. So my conclusion here would be that SM, line segment SM, is going to be congruent to line segment MT. All right. There are other conclusions that you could draw from this. You could say that SM is half the length of ST. You could say the same thing for MT. MT is half the length of, of ST. It, so like I said, it, like a variety of different conclusions. But the one, what I think would be obvious one, if people are having a conversation with each other, M is the middle point, midpoint. What do we know? Well, I guess those two are the same. All right. So what does that mean in geometry notation? It means that. So the reason it's in the beginning, it's, it's not a bad idea to refer back to that table on the front page, but odds are if you have a little bit of an understanding of what a midpoint is, you're going to be able to come up with that definition on your own anyway. So you think to yourself, well, what does a midpoint do? A midpoint cuts a segment into two congruent segments. All right, so that was my thought. It might have been a, a similar thought to you. You might, you might say a, a midpoint makes two congruent segments. Yeah, like your own, your own phrasing is fine. Just refer back to the table on that first page 
as long as your region is in the neighborhood of what the definition is of a midpoint, then you're in good shape. So under midpoint, it says the, the point that divi divides a segment into two congruent segments. Good, got it, right? When we use a, when, we're, when we create a formal proof, you're not gonna have to write out the entire definition because we're gonna rely on the fact that some things are just known definitions. So if this were part of a proof, what we would say is SM and MT are congruent to each other and the reason would be definition of midpoint, all right? So it gets a little bit easier when it's part of a proof, otherwise these things, they end up being essays. Uh, when I used to teach uh, regents level geometry in the high school, uh, the old math A, math B exams, they, they were a nightmare to grade because they, they, they required the students to write out these definitions, and I think the geometry region still requires that. It's like you got to write out this whole thing instead of, instead of saying definition of a midpoint because they, their reasoning is the student doesn't necessarily know what the definition of a midpoint is unless they write it out. And I'm like, well, if they properly used it as part of a proof, then they clearly knew what it meant. Otherwise, they wouldn't have used it in that particular way. So it's implied that they know what the hell they're talking about. So, you know, I'm going to need you to all the way off my back about this. Um, that's a um, pitch meeting reference if anybody likes that sort of thing. Uh, so, like I said, in a proof, we're going to write this as definition of a midpoint, but for now, just to get a feel for what these definitions are, I say we write them out at least this one time. And besides, this becomes part of your reference. We talked about this going into the last assessment that, and, and, um, Somebody made the comment, I think it was Christian, made the comment. Uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was on point because he was like, ah, I'm, I better stop slacking and taking notes. You know, it, it, he didn't say those exact words, but it was something in that neighborhood because there was something that he knew was covered in class that if only it made its way into his notes would have been useful for that assessment. All right. So what you're gonna get by completing out this, this page with the properly noted definitions is kind of like a living, breathing reference sheet related to the rules on the front page, all right? So it's, it's for your own good. BD bisects ABC, all right? So bisects. Well, the bi part is two, you know, binary, binomial, uh, bicycle, you know. So referencing to diagram in this case, um, it, it's pretty spot on in, in terms of being drawn to scale. So BD, as it relates to angle ABC, it looks like it's splitting that angle in half, right? But we want to talk about congruence. So what I would conclude here is that this angle and this angle are the same. So I would say angle ABD is congruent to angle, and again, name it any way you want, as long as the vertex of that angle is the middle letter, All right? So the other angle I can call DBC, I can call it CBD, I'll call it CBD. Seems relevant, yeah. The reason uh, later on, we'll say definition of a bisector. But for now, what we're going to say, or angle bisector, is an angle bisector. Let me zoom in on that a little bit. Cuts an angle and angle. Into two congruent angles. All right. So, like I said, later on it'll be definition of angle bisector, but for now it's that. And we just refer back angle bisector array 
line or line segment that divides an angle into two congruent angles. All right, ours is a little less elaborate than that, but I feel like we got all the, the important points here. A, B bisects X, Y, and M. All right, this kind of has the same feel as number one, where something is getting, a line segment is getting split in half, but one of the, you know, the thing doing the cutting is not a point, it's another line segment. And that's fine, we can draw the same conclusion from that. Uh, it's just a question of what is the thing that's getting bisected. In this case, it's X, Y. So these two segments are the only two that I can conclude are going to be congruent to one another. All right. When you're dealing with bisectors, it can, it can kind of be tricky because there's situations where one line segment will bisect another or maybe they bisect each other. Right? I, I kind of look at the analogy I use is uh, the, the knife and the butter. Right? So which one is the knife and which one's the butter? So you have AB is bisecting, so AB is the knife, XY is the butter. This is the one that's cutting that one, right? If they're, if they're bisecting each other, then my knife-butter analogy doesn't work because the butter isn't going to cut the knife, right? So it would have to be something where two things could actually cut each other, which is kind of hard to conceptualize, at least in terms of a real-life thing. So, in this case, I would say XM congruent to MY or YM. Either way, I'll say MY. All right, so here we're not talking about a midpoint, though. We're talking about a bisector. So, a bisector cuts a segment into two congruent segments. So very similar in terms of the, the reason as the midpoint, except take out the word midpoint and throw in bisector. Now, here I didn't say segment bisector or line bisector or anything like that. It's really more about the absence of a word than the presence of the word. So I, in the previous one, I said the angle bisector. Here, just a bisector. So that bisector could be anything. It could be a ray, it could be a line segment, it could be a line. I don't wanna limit myself, slash, I don't wanna accidentally say the wrong thing. All right, so putting myself in your shoes, I don't wanna be in a point where I put down a reason, you know, like something like uh, a line bisector, but it's really a line segment. Okay? You lose credit for that because it's not technically correct or, or vice versa, or, you know, it's a ray as opposed to a line. So just by saying a bisector and the fact that you're cutting that segment, you're, you've gotten across the, uh, the concept. Uh, you could never bisect a line. You can only bisect a segment. The reason why is because the line is infinite, goes off in either direction without end. So how do you find the halfway point of something that doesn't end? Uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't make sense, All right, at least uh, not in a practical way. A, B, upside down T, that's the perpendicular symbol to L, M, H, A. Right? So it's telling us where that location of perpendicularity just to throw in a fancy term there, is going to be occurring. But if we know that we're looking at perpendicular at J, we know that each one of these angles are going to be right angles. Now, there's a, there's a lot of layers to this because you can, you can kind of play this out and you say, wait a minute. All right. So... They're perpendicular, which means they're all 90, degree, uh, 90 degrees. They're all 90 degrees, which means that they're all right angles. 
they're all right angles and 90 degrees, so that does not mean that they're all congruent to one another. So which one do I write? Well, the answer is, for the conclusion, you write all of that, but in the most concise way that you can think of, all right? So what I would write is the measure Pen does not want to turn on. There it is. Measure of angle. Oh, and before I go too crazy here, because naming angles is something that really tends to be the, a source of aggravation for people, not because they'll screw it up. It's just because it's just a lot to write. You can define your angles any way you want. So what you could do is call this angle one, two, three, and four. Any way you want, as long as you have some sort of scheme behind it. For my purposes, generally what you should do is, is come up with a, um, a key indicating what each angle is equivalent to. Like let angle one be equivalent to angle L, J, whatever. Uh, for me, as long as you label the diagram, that's going to be fine. All right, so here, it, it just makes life a little bit easier. We would be saying that angle one is congruent to angle two, congruent to angle three, which is congruent to angle four. Now, another, another thing I could write is that the measure of angle one, two, three, and four are all equal and equal specifically to 90 degrees. I don't want to write that. So what I will do instead is say angle one, two, three, and four. Let me put a semicolon in between. Are right angles. All right, so the right angle concept gets across the 90 degrees. The fact that they're all 90 degrees gets across the idea that they're all congruent. All right. But ultimately, since we're going to have to establish congruence relations between multiple angles, the, the first conclusion there is the most important one. All right. So the reason, well, the reason is pretty much going to be me phrasing out in words what I just wrote, all right? So what happened? The perpendicular intersection created four right angles. So perpendicular lines form right angles and all right angles are congruent. Taking a little liberties with the notation here. We're taking some liberties. All right, so perpendicular lines form right angles. And those right angles, because they're all, all right angles are 90 degrees, they would then therefore have to be congruent to one another. So, perpendicular intersecting lines to form 90 degree angles. Got it. Uh, perpendicular bisector, which we'll get to in a second, a line perpendicular to a segment at the segment's midpoint. Right? So that's gonna combine ideas, but you know, like you can see how what we're doing is we're just trying to take what our intuition is telling us and try to tie it together with something else. Um, Perpendicular 90 degrees. Yeah, so we got, we, we got, yep, yeah, we got everything that we needed there. All right, so if it's a perpendicular bisector, we're taking the ideas from number one, combining it with number four, and we're coming up with uh, a, a couple of extra layers here. So we have AB is a perpendicular bisector of LM at J. <clears throat> All right, so. Everything that we just stated in number four would still be true. So I'm not going to make us write all that again. So everything in 
in number four, and I'll say plus LM is the thing being bisected. So we would say LJ is congruent to JM. So again, everything in number four plus Because a perpendicular bisector is perpendicular and also a bisector. So address perpendicular and also address being a bisector. So, and in fact, you know what? I'm going to take the plus out. And I'm going to get a little crazy here. I'm going to use the logical and symbol. Just to kind of justify teaching that. Not really. I'm going to make it uh, this orange color here. So, and, and. So, I would say a bisector cuts an angle, uh, a segment, into congruent segments. Right, so we're merging ideas together. And when you when you tackle a proof, you know, statements, reason, two column proof, you'll see that that's um, that's going to be the norm. Number six, last one on this page. Uh, ABD and CBD are complementary angles. Complementary angles are angles that add to ninety degrees. So actually, just by knowing what a complementary angle is, I got the reason already. So complementary angles complementary angles add to 90 degrees. Um, now obviously being in a math class you wouldn't expect to lose any credit for spelling like under any circumstances. However, there is one circumstance really in any class that I teach. Out of all the classes I teach, there's only one instance where I take off for spelling. And it's this one word. You misspell complimentary, you're losing a point. Well, half a point, sorry, not a full point. Right, this is complementary, not complementary. Right, it's a different word. We use words in real life differently than the way we use them, uh, them in math class. But sometimes we use words really al almost exclusively in math class. And then sometimes, you know, it's kind of a hybrid. Uh, complementary is one of those words where if you're paying somebody a compliment, different word. All right, that's, that's got an I in it. A complement is to kind of, I mean, if you're really just thinking in the, in the way it's used in everyday life, if I'm going to complement somebody else's work, what work, the work I do should essentially complete their work, right? The two together should kind of synergistically form something else. All right. So when you're working in small groups to complete an assessment, your work should complement each other's work, all right? So keep that in mind, especially since I can't think of any circumstance in which you wouldn't have access to the correct spelling of this word, because it's gonna be open notes, and or it'll be written in the problem somewhere. So screw this one up, half point deduction, you could spell everything else wrong, including your name, and I don't care. All right, spell my name wrong too. Uh, spell things, uh, spell other words wrong on purpose now, 
just to just to to prove my point for me. All right. Like just make up a, like atrocious spellings for words that are obvious. All right. So like spell wit, spell it W O T H. I, I don't know. Just make up something horrendous. You'll see no issue right there. I'll circle and say great job, smiley face. You blow it on complimentary or losing a half a point. All right. So they add up to 90 degrees. Now again, if you don't want to actually state the real name of the angle, you could create numerical values and, and, and go that route. But here it's just the two angles. So I'm looking at A, B, D. Now these are measures. Plus the measure of C, B, D is going to be equal to 90 degrees. All right, we wouldn't just say angle ABD plus CBD because an angle without a measure does not have a numerical value, all right? So that M has to be there in order for it to be technically correct. It's a lot of geometry looking. So methods for proving triangles congruent. Well, there's a fair few of them. I find that uh, the best way to understand the methods by which you could prove triangles congruent is really to try to determine which ones, which techniques won't allow you to prove that your triangles congruent. So we have the SSS axiom, SAS, ASA, AAS, and then just to mix it up, HL. The HL theorem is different because that, that applies specifically to right triangles. These first four axioms apply to any triangles, all right, or any triangle. So we have side, side, side. What that means is that if you have three sets of corresponding sides that are congruent, then the triangles will themselves be congruent. So for example, if I know this side is congruent to this one, and I also know this side is congruent to this one, and I know this side is congruent to this one, then those two triangles would be congruent to one another. All right. So you, you kind of hear, hopefully, the logic in there, where it's a conditional sentence. If these three pieces of information are in play, then the triangles are congruent. So I have if this is congruent to that, and this is congruent to that, and this is congruent to that, then these two triangles are congruent. Now, you can kind of look at that and say, well, yeah, no duh. If you're telling me that all three sides in one triangle are congruent or the same as all three sides in another triangle, that the triangles would be the same? Yeah, that kind of makes sense. But you know, like the, the reasoning behind it is coming from that idea of replication. You know, way back when, they had to start somewhere and they say, okay, well, Draw another triangle where all three sides are the same. All right, so uh, not the same as e each other, but same as the corresponding sides of another triangle. Are they still the same triangle? All right, draw another one, draw another one, draw another one. Because you don't necessarily know that the angles are going to play out the way you want them to. All right, because congruence in a triangle means geometrically equivalent. It means that they're the same triangle. All right, so. When, if I were to look at these triangles without any markings on it and, and look at it just at first glance, I'd say, oh, that triangle looks exactly the same as that one. That's congruence, all right? One way in which that happens is if the corresponding sides are all congruent to one another, all right? So as it turns out, there's no way to draw two different triangles where these characteristics are in place. So if the corresponding sides are congruent, those triangles will always be congruent. All right, that's the idea of a proof. We've guaranteed something will always be the case. All right, two triangles are congruent if two sides and the included angle of one triangle are congruent to the same on the other. All right, so this this one's a little, little different because you'd have two congruent sides. So for example, these two are congruent to each other. And let's say these two, uh, yeah. 
but not necessarily the third side. What they're saying is the angle included, the included angle between those two sides. So if I'm going from this side to this side, I'd be looking for the angle that would be separating these two sides. So to get from here to here, I have to pass through this angle here. All right, this vertex angle at the top. So if this formation is true, and there's actually three different ways that this could happen. Well, three distinct ways that this could happen. Uh, then the triangles would be congruent, but maybe it's this left side and the base side, or just the base, with the included angle being the lower left angle. Maybe it's the upper left side and the base with the lower right angle. Not right angle, but as in the angle on the right. Like all different possibilities, but as long as you have two sets of corresponding sides with the included angle, those triangles will be congruent to one another. ASA, same idea, except we're looking at multiple angles and the included side. So for example, um, these two angles, and let me say this set of angles, but the side needs to be the side separated by the two. Or separating the two. All right. And again, it's not just this formation, any formation that has this pattern. All right. So it could be the vertex angle and the angle on the lower left with the side in between those two. You know, it's, it's a lot of different ways it could play out. Uh, next class, which is in two weeks, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to actually not prove, but demonstrate these relationships, you know, using uh, rulers and such. You know, I'm going to show you how you can really kind of, uh, kind of sink your teeth into them because it, right now they're just rules. We want to make it more than that. Angle, angle, side axiom, AAS, two angles where the, the side is actually not contained between the two angles. So let's say here. All right, so I have an angle, I have another angle, and I have a side, but that side is not contained in between the two angles. Whereas in this one, I have an angle an angle, but the side is contained between the two angles. All right. So the, the, the name gives you a clue as to what the organizational strategy should be, but also it kind of goes the other way. Once you have your information labeled up in your triangle, you can kind of think to yourself, okay, well, now that I have that, let's start, let's designate things. Let's call it A, let's call it S. See where that gets us. Oh, A followed by S followed by an A. Oh, that's probably the ASA axiom, all right? A and an A followed by an S. Okay, well, that's not ASA. Maybe that's the AAS axiom, but maybe you have it the other way. Maybe you're reading it right to left, SAA. Well, SAA is the same as AAS, all right? So the reverse is also true. All right, it just wasn't relevant until now because if I reverse SSS, it's still SSS. If I reverse the letters in SAS, it's still SAS. All right, same with ASA. This is the only time, the first time it became relevant. All right. Um, but, you know, you might be wondering about another possibility, like different ways in which you could arrange the letters A and S. You might have the SSA or ASS. That, that's not a thing because well, it, it leads to something that you explore more if you take a trig class. It's uh, called the ambiguous case. Uh, there, there are multiple ways that you can create a triangle if you were to know the angle and two consecutive sides. So if I were to give you that information, if I were to tell you that here's an a known angle and here's two known sides. So you have the ASS relationship. The problem is there's, there's other ways than just this orientation that you can create a triangle 
that has the same measures, but it would be a completely different try. Right? So long story short, and we're going to explore that next class too. Long story short, it's only these methods, right, including the HL theorem. So any other arrangements of the letters A and S, they're, they're not going to fly. It's got to come from this list. Otherwise, it's not a valid technique for proving tribes is congruent. Right. The HL theorem is a nice one, but uh, historically, I found that people um, have just kind of fallen in love with it to the point where they want to use it for everything. It only works for right triangles. Right? So if you're not dealing with a right triangle, this rule does not apply. All right? What it's telling us is that if you know that you're dealing with a right triangle and the hypotenuses of the triangle are congruent and a, a pair of corresponding legs are congruent, then the triangles themselves are congruent. All right. So this is actually kind of a variation of the ASS uh, act of would-be axiom, but it's really only applying to uh, right triangles. All right. So an example before we get hot and heavy into proofs. State the postulate that can be used to prove triangles congruent and write a congruency statement. So we have this information here. So I'm looking at this to see a pair of corresponding sides congruent. Right? The assumption is, and it's a reasonable assumption, that they're looking for us to prove that this triangle is congruent to this triangle. Uh, just as a general rule of thumb, if they're asking you to prove two triangles congruent, those triangles better look generally the same as one another. Right? They may not be drawn perfectly to scale, but like for example, I would never ask you to prove that triangle ABC is congruent to triangle ABD. They're not even remotely the same. Right? One is double the size of the other. Right? But in this case, it seems like we can at least try to prove that ABC is congruent to DBC. So that's what we're going with. It's just a question of, all right, do we have the justification? All right, so let's see. We know that AB and DB are congruent. All right, so I'm going to make a little note here. Justification. All right, AB is congruent to DB. We also know that AC is congruent to DC. These are both given pieces of information. All right, so what I have here is a pair of corresponding sides congruent. Now, I don't know if this is a right triangle. Candace, I mean, they look like they're, uh, like there's 99 and a half percent chance that this, these are two right triangles, but it's not given and they didn't give us any information to determine that, so I can't make that assumption, right? So I have, at best, I have a pair of corresponding sides congruent, and then because this looks like it's a midpoint, these two corresponding sides are congruent, all right? So these two triangles are, con are gonna be congruent by one of two possibilities. If you look at the choices above, we have SSS, SAS, now, the other ones involve knowing multiple angles. I don't know any angles, right? So that's actually going to knock out SAS because they didn't tell me anything about the angles, nor do I have any means by which I could figure out the angles. So something about this diagram is going to allow me to conclude that these two triangles are congruent by the SSS axiom. And that's only because it can't be congruent by anything else, right? So well, if they're going to be congruent by the SSS axiom, the only way that that's going to happen would be 
is if this line segment is congruent really to itself, all right? So I'm gonna make that statement. It's a weird statement, but I'm gonna say that BC is congruent to BC. All right, when a line segment is congruent to itself, what I do is I just put a little X there. All right, it's kind of like a double tick mark, one for one triangle and one for the other. But really what we're looking at here is two connected triangles, but if they were separate, oh man, I cannot draw. And I'll label them up A, B, C, D, B, C. I have, as a given, this is given to, uh, to be congruent to this. This one is given to be congruent to that. And so we could also state just by like, well, they're the same line segment. These two line segments are congruent to one another, all right? So all we need is some kind of justification for this, all right? So how do we know that they're congruent to one another? Well, it goes back to the table on the front page. One way to, to do it would be to say common sense, so that something is congruent to itself, duh, of course it is. BC is congruent to itself, why? Because one is equal to one, uh, smiley face is equal to smiley face, you know, like whatever you could think of, right? But there is a justification for that. The third from the bottom on that front page, and this is gonna be so frequently used that you may wanna put a star next to it, highlight it, circle it, whatever, Reflexive property of congruence, an angle, line, segment, or shape is always congruent to itself. All right? So we're only going to state, because we don't have to write that out every time, that this is the reflexive property. All right? So we stated the postulate that can be used to prove triangles congruent, and we wrote a congruency statement, but we also did a whole lot more that we didn't, you know, than, than we really needed to, but we're building towards something here, so it was worth, it was worth the time, all right? So on the next page, it, it's talking about the same general idea. They're congruent to each other. It's just a question of why. So I'm gonna put a star on this so that you could tackle these on your own for home. Uh, one through 10 is gonna be work. Same idea with uh, seven through uh, 10. So basically, uh, quote unquote homework, but as you know, it's not like I'm gonna check it or anything. It's just, we'll go over it and so on. Uh, we'll do this proof on page 11, uh, number 11 on page five, and then we'll take a break, and then I have a little uh, group activity for you to work on, all right? But this is a, our first foray into the two column uh, concept of a proof and how to properly structure it. Um, coming out of spring break, and it's so weird to think of the spring break, I mean, although I am wearing shorts, so I guess it's fine. Um, Coming out of spring break, we're gonna do, like I said, that exploratory activity where we learn where all those rules, the SAS and stuff like that come from. So it wouldn't make sense to go too, too crazy with these proofs right now, because you know if you don't have the proper grounding and like why things work the way they do, it wouldn't really make too much sense. So today's activity is really just gonna be more along the lines of drawing conclusions, like what we did on that, uh, that one page where it was, what can you can conclude, what can you conclude and why? All right, so statements and reasons is a, you know, it's a reasonable way of structuring your proof. It's an organizational strategy that people tend to stick to because it allows you to clearly state what conclusion you're drawing based on the given information and why those uh, conclusions are being drawn, All right? So the first thing we do is we take our given information and we use that to mark up our diagram. So we mark the living daylights out of it because having a nice diagram is the key to understanding what's going on geometrically. Right. Triangle ABC, okay, cool. You never know, 
It might not be a triangle if it's an incomplete figure or something like that. It's confirming that it's definitely a triangle with AC congruent to BC. All right, so I'm going to mark that up. One tick mark for each of them. All right, so once I've accounted for a piece of information, I include it as a statement. So triangle ABC with AC congruent to BC. All right, and that's a piece of given information. I don't have to justify it using anything more elaborate than that. I take a look to see if I can, you know, it's, it's like Wheel of Fortune. Like, can I solve the puzzle? All right, am I at the point where I can get to the proof state? Can I now say, oh, okay, I got my given piece of information. Can I now say those two triangles are congruent? No, I need to buy a dollar or something. You know? So D is the midpoint of AB. All right, so let's work off of that. If D is the midpoint of AB, that means these two bad boys are congruent. So I'll make a note. My second statement is D is the midpoint, abbreviations are fine, of AB. Again, it's a given. But we can draw a conclusion from this because this, con you know, this statement here doesn't talk about congruence. All right, this helped me mark that up, but just kind of on the fly, we drew a conclusion that those two line segments are congruent, but we never stated it in our proof. So that has to come. So this is still along the same thread. I would say AD is congruent to BD or DB either way. Now you just need a reason for it, right? So you just think about, well, what caused you to draw the conclusion to begin with? Well, it was because D was the midpoint of AB that we said that those two line segments are congruent, All right? So odds are your reason is gonna be definition of something, All right? Well, we have it, definition of midpoint. All right, so then again, wheel of fortune approach, you're looking at it like, can I solve the puzzle? Not quite. So we spin the wheel. Well, we have no more givens, so now I'm just gonna look at the picture. Fortunately, this is very similar to what we were just talking about. I do have that line segment CD that I know has to be congruent to itself. So CD is congruent to CD. And that's the reflexive property. And so, well, we've covered all the sides we haven't addressed any of the angles, but that's okay. Because one of our postulates that allows for proving triangles to be congruent to one another is if each set of corresponding sides are congruent. So this one's congruent to that, this one's congruent to that, and this one's congruent to that, then the two triangles are themselves congruent to each other. So I can now solve the puzzle. Triangle ACD is in fact congruent to triangle BCD and that would be by the SSS axiom. 